Welcome to the Human Health Campus Pediatric Nuclear Medicine Webinar Series. This webinar is entitled Nuclear Medicine Evaluation of Gastroesophageal Reflux and Pulmonary Aspiration in Children, and is presented by V. Bar Sever from the Department of Nuclear Medicine, Schneider Children's Medical Center, Israel. I am pleased to present this seminar to you on behalf of the Nuclear Medicine and Diagnostic Imaging Section of the International Atomic Energy Agency, in collaboration with the European Association of Nuclear Medicine. This webinar will first introduce the phenomenon of gastroesophageal reflux in children, the pathophysiology, clinical presentations, complications, and diagnostic methods. I will describe in detail gastroesophageal reflux scintigraphy along with clinical cases. The next topic will be pulmonary aspiration. Types of aspiration, their mechanisms and complications will be described. Nuclear medicine studies for the detection of aspiration will be presented with their strengths and limitations along with clinical examples. Gastroesophageal reflux is defined as the retrograde movement of solids and liquids from the stomach into the esophagus. In young babies, reflux occurs due to abnormal transient relaxations of the lower esophageal sphincter, reflecting the immaturity of the sphincter mechanism. In the majority of infants, it is a transient phenomenon which resolves spontaneously with growth. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is a clinical condition that includes complications of gastroesophageal reflux in the GI system, in the respiratory system, or in both. As mentioned, gastroesophageal reflux is a common transient condition in well-thriving babies. It can be asymptomatic or present as regurgitation or occasional vomiting. In approximately 10% of the cases, complications occur involving the gastrointestinal and respiratory systems. Complications are caused by direct exposure to gastric contents that can damage the esophageal mucosa or lung parenchyma. Pulmonary complications may also occur as a result of a reflex mechanism. It is thought that irritation of the esophageal mucosa triggers a reflex causing apnea or bronchospasm in the lungs. Indeed, gastroesophageal reflux is one of the etiologies of asthma in children. In babies and young children, gastroesophageal reflux can present as recurrent and frequent vomiting. It may cause esophagitis leading to hematemesis, strictures, anorexia, dysphagia, anemia, and failure to thrive. It can rarely cause metaplasia, metaplasia of the esophageal mucosa. The typical presentation of gastroesophageal reflux in older children and in teenagers is heartburn. In the respiratory system, recurrent reflux episodes are the cause of asthma, recurrent pneumonia, secondary to aspiration of gastric contents, and ultimately progressing to chronic lung disease. In milder cases, it may present as stridor, hoarseness, or chronic cough. In young infants, especially in preterm infants, reflux is associated with apnea episodes, apparent life-threatening events, and sudden infant death syndrome. In infants and young children, gastroesophageal reflux can rarely cause spasmodic torticollis and dystonic movements, sometimes mistaken as seizures. This condition is known as Sandifer syndrome. It is important to correctly diagnose the presence of reflux and or aspiration because the signs and symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease are not specific and may be due to other conditions. The common diagnostic modalities in routine clinical practice include the extended esophageal pH monitoring, which is traditionally considered as the gold standard. It is an invasive procedure that requires placement of a transnasal catheter with pH recording electrodes in the esophagus. The electrodes are positioned at different levels. When the electrodes record a drop in the esophageal pH below 4, it indicates a reflux episode. The number of reflux episodes and overall residence time of acidic gastric contents in the esophagus during a 24-hour observation period can be recorded. A limitation of this technique is that it is designed to record acidic reflux episode. It is known that some postprandial reflux episodes are non-acidic, 
but nevertheless can be associated with complications. Gastroesophageal reflux scintigraphy, also known as the milk scan, is a sensitive technique to detect gastroesophageal reflux and will be discussed in details in the next slides. Barium upper GI series are used as well, but have limited sensitivity in detecting reflux and aspiration. This study can identify conditions producing symptoms similar to gastroesophageal reflux disease, for example, pyloric stenosis or gut malrotation. This study can also identify complications of reflux, such as esophagitis and esophageal strictures. Endoscopy is a common procedure in modern gastroenterology. It is not used for the diagnosis of reflux, but is useful in evaluating esophageal complications of gastroesophageal reflux disease. I will briefly mention some new and investigational techniques that are not employed in routine practice. One of them is the multiple intraluminal electrical impedance. This study also requires placement of a catheter in the esophagus. Electrodes at various levels of the catheter can identify anti-grade and retrograde motion in the esophagus by measuring changes in the electrical impedance. This study can identify non-acidic reflux episodes and can be combined with extended esophageal pH monitoring. Ultrasound is a non-invasive investigational technique that can also show gastroesophageal reflux by detection of opening of the lower esophageal sphincter and fluid movement from the stomach into the esophagus and back into the stomach. I would like to explain the milk scan technique as performed in my department. Preparations include a fast of four to six hours. In infants that are being fed every three to four hours, the study can be timed to replace a normal scheduled meal. You should instruct the parents to bring with them two baby bottles with the regular milk or milk formula used to feed their child. In case of known allergy, make sure to use non-allergenic milk formulas. The child is fed with milk, either cow or human milk, milk formula, or milk-based drink in older children. The meal volume should be similar to the regular meal volume given to the child at home, roughly between 50 to 250 mLs. The radiopharmaceutical is technetium 99M sulfur colloid, the activity 9.25 megabecquerels. The meal is divided into two separate bottles. The first bottle should contain one-third of the total meal volume mixed with the radiopharmaceutical and should be administered first. The remaining two-thirds of the unlabeled meal should be administered in the second bottle to wash all residual activity from the mouth and esophagus or from the feeding tube if used. The administration route is typically oral, however, children with feeding difficulties can be fed through a feeding gastrostomy tube or through a nasogastric tube that needs to be removed prior to imaging. The feeding time is 10 to 15 minutes. It is important to cover the child with an absorbent sheet to prevent external contamination. Regarding the imaging protocol, the child is imaged in the supine position. The camera head, equipped with a low-energy, high-resolution collimator, is positioned under the imaging bed with the thorax and upper abdomen in the field of view. Posterior view dynamic images are acquired for 60 minutes, 30 seconds per frame on a 128 by 128 matrix with an appropriate zoom. Anterior and posterior static images of the chest are obtained at one and four hours. If combined with gastric emptying evaluation, two and three hour images should be obtained as well with the stomach in the field of view. Radioactive markers or cobalt-57 transmission source image can be used for orientation when required. Some variations from the proposed protocol have been described in the literature. For instance, some centers prefer to use a shorter frame time of 10 to 15 seconds instead of 30 seconds. One author reported that this protocol allowed the detection of more reflux episodes, despite the lower count rate. Another study suggested that it is possible to shorten the imaging time 
because most of the reflux episodes occur within the first 30 minutes prior to significant emptying of the stomach. A different study found that by changing body positions during acquisition, there was a threefold increase in the number of reflux episodes detected compared to the supine position only. However, this technique may be difficult to apply to uncooperative children. Interpretation of gastroesophageal reflux scan requires careful inspection of individual frames and the cinematic display of the dynamic study. Manipulating the grayscale window is also helpful in the detection of subtle abnormalities. The number of reflux episodes and the level of the reflux in the esophagus, either proximal or distal, should be, should be reported. Dividing the number of frames showing esophageal activity by the total number of frames provides a crude estimate of the reflux residence time. Creation of an esophageal time activity curve from an esophageal region of interest is optional. The curve is prone to motion artifacts that can introduce errors by including stomach activity in the esophageal region of interest. Creation of a condensed image from individual frames has also been used, however, one study found that visual assessment was superior to time activity curve and condensed image interpretations. Finally, one should carefully inspect the lung fields for any evidence of tracer localization in the airways or lung parenchyma due to pulmonary aspiration. Keep in mind that activity over the lung fields can sometimes be due to external contamination. This is an example of a milk scan showing multiple gastroesophageal reflux episodes to the proximal esophagus. This is a case of a 15-year-old girl with recurrent vomiting and rumination. Her gastroesophageal reflux study shows several episodes of reflux, some reaching the proximal esophagus. The time activity curve from the esophageal region of interest displays reflux episodes as sharp peaks in the curve. This was a cooperative patient. Obtaining a valid time activity curve in young children that are prone to motion is challenging. This is a case of a 15-month-old boy with developmental delay, hearing loss, laryngotracheomalacia, and recurrent pneumonia. Anti-reflux surgery and insertion of a feeding gastrostomy tube were performed a few months prior to the study. The child was fed with ATCC lab label milk for formula through his gastric tube. Frames from the first eight minutes of the study are shown. Please answer the questions. These images show, number one, delayed gastric emptying, number two, pulmonary aspiration, number three, mild reflux to the distal esophagus, number four, significant reflux to the proximal esophagus with delayed clearance of gastric contents from the esophagus. Please choose. Yes, the correct answer is number four, significant reflux to the proximal esophagus with delayed clearance of gastric contents from the esophagus. The entire dynamic study is presented in one minute frames. Please look at the images and decide. Is gastric emptying based on your visual assessment normal or abnormal? Yes, based on visual assessment, there appears to be normal gastric emptying during the first hour. Gastric residual at one hour and on later time points, when two, three, and four hour images are acquired, can be calculated by placing regions of interests on the stomach in the first frame and the last frame or on the late static images. The gastric residue is obtained by dividing the gastric counts in the desired time point corrected for decay and acquisition time with the initial gastric counts. This is a case of an 11-month-old boy 
that presented with asthma and recurrent vomiting. A milk scan was requested by the referring physician. Why is the milk scan useful in this evaluation? Please answer question number three. Option number one, gastroesophageal reflux is a known trigger for vomiting. Number two, pulmonary aspiration can cause bronchospasm and asthma. Number three, gastroesophageal reflux without aspiration is a known cause of hyperactive airways. And option number four states that all answers are correct. So make up your minds, one, two, three, or four. Yes, the correct answer is number four. All answers are correct. This is a milk scan of an 11-month-old boy with asthma and recurrent vomiting. Look at the images and decide how many reflux episodes can you count. Look carefully at the images. Are there only five episodes, or option number two, 50 episodes, number three, 15 episodes, or number four, 30 episodes? Decide, please. Okay, the correct answer is 15 episodes. Please note that not every frame showing tracer in the esophagus indicates a new reflux episode. Persistence of tracer localization in the esophagus may reflect delayed clearance, possibly due to abnormal esophageal motility. It has been reported that by shortening acquisition frame times to 10 or 15 seconds per frame, more individual reflux episodes can be seen. The downside of this suggestion is that Count density is reduced, limiting the accuracy of identifying ectopic activity both in the esophagus and in the lung. A new question now. Um, a technologist mixed 9.25 megabecquerel technetium 99M sulfur colloid with milk in a bottle containing two thirds of the desired feeding volume leaving one-third of the volume unlabeled. What should you tell him? Number one, good job, you followed the feeding protocol. Number two, you should have mixed the radiopharmaceutical in half of the meal volume. Number three, bad job, you should have mixed the tracer in one-third of the meal volume. Number four, bad job, you should have administered the tracer with a syringe directly into the mouth. Please make up your minds. The correct answer is number three. He should have added the tracer to the bottle containing one third of the meal volume. Remember, it is essential after feeding is complete that no residual tracer remains in the mouth or pharynx or the esophagus. This is achieved by completing the desired meal volume with the unlabeled portion of the meal. The risk of mixing the tracer in a large portion of the meal is that the child might refuse to ingest the entire volume he will receive less than the prescribed tracer activity and will not ingest the unlabeled portion of the meal required to wash the residual activity from the mouth and esophagus. So how does gastroesophageal reflux compare to other diagnostic methods? It has distinct advantages in being a highly sensitive, non-invasive, physiologic, and direct technique. The child is fed with his regular meal and regular meal volume. No external manipulations are required. For example, the barium upper GI series uses barium which is non-physiologic with unfavorable taste to many children. Often children are not willing to ingest the contrast. Milk scans are easy to perform, do not require significant cooperation, and have a low radiation burden. They are more sensitive than upper GI series in detecting aspiration of gastric contents. Unlike extended esophageal pH recording, they can detect both acidic 
and non-acidic reflux episodes. They can also demonstrate pulmonary aspiration and can be combined with a liquid gastric emptying scintigraphy, allowing evaluation of three important factors in one single study, reflux, aspiration, and gastric emptying. The next topic of this webinar is scintigraphic techniques to detect pulmonary aspiration. I will start with some background information. There are three sources of, for pulmonary aspiration. Aspiration of food, meaning solids or liquids, that may occur during feeding. Aspiration of gastric contents due to gastroesophageal reflux or vomiting. And aspiration of salivary oral secretions. Foreign body aspiration is another source but will not be discussed here. Aspiration is more commonly seen in the presence of one or more of these risk factors, congenital or acquired neurological disabilities that affect the swallowing mechanism, congenital malformations of the head and neck, a typical example is cleft palate or tracheoesophageal fistula, and surgery of the upper airways or upper digestive tract. Pulmonary aspiration may present as recurrent pneumonia at any age. Episodes of apnea and apparent life-threatening events in young babies and asthma in older children. Repeated aspirations lead to chronic debilitating lung disease and to respiratory insufficiency. As mentioned earlier, the gastroesophageal reflux study is one of the nuclear medicine studies that can detect aspiration. It can detect aspiration of gastric contents, and often this is the main indication for this study. In clinical practice, however, aspiration is not commonly seen on milk scans, even in patients with a high clinical suspicion for aspiration. According to the literature, aspiration is identified in 1 to 25% of the studies, but in most cases it is around 2%. This is puzzling because phantom studies show that very little activity can be detected in the thorax. On the other hand, there is evidence that improvement in lung disease can be expected in children with suspected aspiration, with milk scans showing reflux but no aspiration. Most authors agree that despite the low utility of milk scans in showing aspiration, they still are more sensitive than barium upper GI series in showing aspiration of gastric contents. This slide shows episodes of gastroesophageal reflux on the first frame and a second episode on the third frame. From that point onward, diffuse activity can be seen over the lung fields consistent with pulmonary aspiration. This milk scan was performed on a one-year-old child with severe neurological impairment and recurrent lung infections. Aspiration was suspected. The arrows show episodes of reflux on selected frames from his study. The one hour static image of the chest shows clear lung fields. The late four hour image, however, shows tracer activity in the trachea and the proximal left and right main bronchi, indicating pulmonary aspiration. This example emphasizes the importance of obtaining a late image. It increases the sensitivity of the study in capturing an episode of pulmonary aspiration. This is a case of a two-year-old boy presenting with choking episodes after meals. He suffered from developmental delay, hypotonia, failure to thrive, and feeding difficulties. He was fed through a nasogastric tube that was removed prior to imaging. Ten minutes after the study started, the child vomited and acquisition was stopped. You can see selected frames from the study showing the vomiting episodes. The red arrow shows diffuse activity over the right chest. The question is, what does this activity indicate? Number one. Pulmonary aspiration into the right lung. Number two, massive gastroesophageal reflux. Number three, external contamination. Or number four, could be contamination, aspiration, or both. Please look at the images and decide.
The correct answer is number four. This ectopic activity could be either contamination, aspiration, or a combination of both options. So what should be done in these circumstances? Number one, continue with the scan. Number two, clean the child, change his clothes, and continue the scan if the child's condition allows it. And number three, terminate the study. So look at the images and decide. The correct answer is number two. Clean the child, change his clothes, and continue the scan if his medical condition allows it. Indeed, the child was cleaned and his clothes were changed. Since he didn't seem to be in distress, imaging was continued. We performed a high count static image of the chest and a transmission image of the chest using a Cobalt 57 flood source. The two images were superimposed, as you can see. So what are the main findings in these images? Number one, there is some activity in the mouth, but no reflux and no aspiration. Number two, normal activity in the stomach and bowel. Number three, subtle aspiration into the trachea, left main bronchus, and questionably into the right main bronchus. And number four, aspiration into the right lung as seen on the dynamic images. This is a tough one. And the correct answer is subtle aspiration into the trachea, left main bronchus, questionably into the right main bronchus. There is some activity, diffuse faint activity in the upper, what appears to be the upper right thorax, but in my mind, this is probably a contamination. External contamination in milk scans can occur during feeding and during imaging, secondary to vomiting and regurgitation. It is recommended to place absorbent sheets over the chest both during feeding and during imaging to help prevent and control contaminations. The radionuclide salivagram is another scintigraphic technique to detect aspiration. This study, however, is specifically designed to detect aspiration of saliva. It is not the radionuclide equivalent of the radiologic barium swallow study that shows aspiration occurring during eating and drinking. Salivary secretions contain anaerobic bacteria from the normal flora of the oropharynx. Aspirated saliva transfers this bacteria into the lungs where they can cause recurrent infections. It is believed that aspiration of saliva is the explanation for ongoing pulmonary infections in children who were previously treated by anti-reflux surgery and discontinuation of oral feedings as means to prevent aspirations. These measures control the aspiration of food and gastric contents, but do not prevent aspiration of saliva. It is important to realize that salivagrams and milk scans target different types of aspiration. Milk scans can show aspiration of gastric contents, while salivagrams show aspiration of salivary secretions. In fact, the salivagram is the only diagnostic test that can detect aspiration of saliva. It is recommended in clinical practice to perform both milk scans and the salivagram in children with recurrent lung infections and suspected aspirations. The salivagram is a simple study to perform. No preparation is required. Sedation should be avoided both in salivagrams and milk scans because it might adversely affect the performance of the swallowing mechanism. The radio pharmaceutical is technetium 99 m sulfur colloid and the dose is 11 megabecquerel. The dose should be contained in a very small volume of no more than one drop. The drop is instilled into the mouth after the child is positioned and ready for imaging. Since the volume is so small, the child doesn't attempt to drink the radio pharmaceutical as would occur with a larger liquid volume. Instead, the tracer mixes with saliva in the oral cavity and labels it. 
Swallowing of saliva is an involuntary process. When salivary secretions are swallowed, this process can be followed with dynamic images. The acquisition protocol consists of posterior view dynamic images, 30 seconds per frame, 128 by 128 matrix for 60 minutes. The zoom should be appropriate for the child's size. At the end of the dynamic acquisition, anterior and posterior static images of the chest are acquired. If no aspiration was seen and there is sufficient tracer activity remaining in the mouth, repeat the static images at two hours. Normally, one should see activity in the mouth, along the esophagus, in the stomach and bowel. Ectopic tracer localization in the airways or lung parenchyma indicates aspiration of saliva. Aspiration may be seen in the proximal airways, in the distal airways, or diffusely in the lung parenchyma. Aspiration of saliva is quite often seen in children with risk factors for aspiration, mainly with neurological disabilities. We identified saliva aspiration in 26% of children with risk factors and lung disease. Others reported a similar incidence. The saliva gram detects more aspiration episodes than the barium swallow, although, as mentioned earlier, these are different types of aspiration. This is an example of a radionuclide saliva gram showing aspiration into the large airways. Here we have a case of a four-year-old girl with recurrent pneumonia, epilepsy, and psychomotor retardation. A saliva gram was obtained due to suspected aspirations of salivary secretions. What are the findings in this saliva gram? Look carefully at the images and choose. Number one, normal transit of saliva from the mouth to the stomach. Number two, aspiration of saliva into the right and left main bronchi. Number three, delayed gastric emptying. And number four, aspiration of saliva to the right upper lobe lung parenchyma. Look at the images and choose. The correct answer is number two, aspiration of saliva into the right and left main bronchi. Now look carefully again at the images. Can you say anything from this study about the integrity of the pulmonary defense mechanisms? So number one, they are clearly abnormal because aspiration is seen. Number two, the swallowing mechanism is impaired, but there is clearance of aspirated tracer from the airways indicating that some of the protective mechanisms are intact. And number three, the study cannot evaluate the effectiveness of pulmonary protective mechanisms. So please choose. Number two is the correct answer. The swallowing mechanism is impaired because aspiration occurred, but there is clearance of aspirated saliva from the airways, indicating that some of the protective mechanisms are intact. An important feature of the radionuclide salivagram is its ability to demonstrate the efficiency of pulmonary protective mechanisms responsible for clearance of aspirated saliva. These mechanisms are, for instance, the cough reflex and the mucociliary transport system. This is a milk scan of a 17-month-old girl with history of intrauterine growth retardation, prematurity, developmental delay, feeding difficulties, and recurrent pulmonary infections. Due to suspected aspiration, she underwent anti-reflux surgery to prevent gastroesophageal reflux. A gastrostomy feeding tube was inserted and oral feedings were discontinued to prevent aspiration of food. Despite these measures, she continued to suffer from pulmonary infections. Look at her milk scan. What can you say regarding the patency of the fundoplication surgery, anti-reflux surgery? Option number one, no reflux or aspiration are seen. The surgery was successful. 
Number two, the study shows gastroesophageal reflux, meaning that the fundoplication has failed. Let's look at the images and decide. The correct answer is number one. No reflux or, or aspiration are seen and the surgery was successful. This slide shows her radionuclide salivagram. What is your interpretation of this salivagram? Is this a number one normal study? Number two, saliva aspiration seen only on the two hour images? Number three, aspiration into the right main bronchus is seen both in the dynamic and two hour static images? Number four, the dynamic images show aspiration into the left main bronchus followed by clearance of the tracer. The two hour images show new aspiration into the right main bronchus. Look, look carefully at the images and decide. The correct answer is number four. The dynamic images show aspiration into the left main bronchus followed by clearance of the tracer. The two hour images show new aspiration into the right main bronchus. Aspiration of saliva should always be considered in children with ongoing pulmonary infections, especially in neurologically debilitated children. The likelihood that anti-reflux surgery and discontinuation of oral feedings will reduce pulmonary morbidity should be determined in conjunction with the salivagram results. So this is the end of the webinar and I would like to thank you for your attention.